Hey everyone, we're back with another week of Find Your Film. This is the week covering November 12th, 2000. Is it November 12th or November 19th? November 12th, 2021. We have three movies. Yes, Bruce Perky, aka Perkina, Perkira or Perkia? Perkira? Bruce Perky, what are you this week? I can be Perkina if you'd prefer me to be. Oh, <laughs> I think no. I'm Perkira. <laughs> Perkira, per okay. So, and then Holmes, Holmes Notice. How are you, Eric Holmes? You doing good? Yeah, yeah, I got a cracked rib and uh how did you get the cracked rib? What's going on with that? <laughs> I got uh, got real sick and started coughing a lot and then Ooh. fucked up my rib. Just uh, you know, being old, so doing normal things seems to break me, which is always fun. Are you going to see a specialist, a doctor for that cracked rib, or are you gonna self heal? What what do you do? Do you self-heal on your own? How does that uh, work out? With the ribs, I guess all you can do is just wait it out and you know, it's it's not like an arm that you can put in a brace or anything, and your ribs always are moving. Yeah. Or I could yeah. hold, or I could hold my breath for a couple months and then oh, heal geez. real quick. Jeez. Well, hope you get better, Eric Holmes. How long you so? It's gonna take a while for you to get fully recovered. Yeah, on that, on I, that. I think it was a couple months. I think. Okay, couple months. Jeez. That I'm, I'm now. I don't know if well, Bruce. Should we continue? I'm sad. I'm sad for our buddy Eric. Aren't, should we? Can should we push forward? Should we persevere? Bruce, do you have a crack? Rib? What do you got? Tough. He's, He's tough. tough. He okay. can do this. Okay. <laughs> okay. Eric Holmes. Okay. Tough enough. <laughs> That's music copyright. Now I, I suddenly don't feel sorry for Eric Holmes. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, you okay, Bruce? No crack rib. You're okay. Your health is everything fine. I mean, yeah. yeah so something's always cracked in me, but you know, I'll just <laughs> pick what it is. Was it a good movie watching week for you? I, I'm looking at your Google Doc notes, which you send us every week, and you seem to again take the cake. You've 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 seen the most movies out of all of us. You've seen a lot, a lot of some gems this week that we're going to cover. Yeah, there's some gems in here. There might even be a special something that you'll have to screen share when we get to the point. I'll tell you when. I don't know. I got to learn how to screen share. I, I've got to learn. Okay, I'm, I, I might as well start learning this episode on how to share. I see on my Zoom it says share screen, so I, hopefully that. That works out. We'll we'll see if if my my tech my non untech savvy brain my tech unsavvy brain can actually figure how to share a screen on Zoom. Okay, but it's a surprise, right, Bruce? This is a little surprise this week. It is a surprise. Yes. Okay. For, okay. You know what? Let me just Eric. You got anything? How's your anything going on with you? You I think you said something on Facebook group about artwork and you had stuff going on with your game, your your movie. Oh, yeah. What's going on? Yeah, I was just uh, looking for some artwork because uh, I'm making the cardboard version of the board game the cheaper version and i need someone to do some artwork for that so if you're listening to this and you want to hit me up to do some artwork uh, hit me up at hamslime at gmail.com but i did get a lead from uh one of our facebook listener or uh the facebook group members from cinematics members, yeah. yeah nathan day apparently yeah. he wrote a uh, book at least one yes that just came in the that just came in the mail today so uh nathan day is the author of what is it, Eric? What does it say? Orphan surfacing. I think. I think now nice he cover. can. He can. Uh, he can correct me. I think it's called orphan and surfacing is the name of this this particular one. Like orphans, okay, the series it. surfacing is the name of this particular book. I could be wrong, but that's. I, I literally just got it like a couple minutes ago, so I haven't had a chance to crack it open yet. But uh, yeah, it I, looks I'm, like I'm a, looking forward to, th oh, to this one. Okay, it looks like a big book from Nathan Day. He's a buddy of ours, and he's a member of our yeah. Cinematics Facebook group. He's a he's an author. He's a he yeah. loves writing and he loves cinema. Eric, maybe if he's so inclined, perhaps we'll get him on the show sometime to talk about his book and any other ones he has uh, he has coming up. I don't want any more people in our universe, Eric. What, Nathan Day's our friend, but you know who? Did you, <laughs> what, come on, Bruce. What do you say? Do you is, is, should, am I being too unfriendly here? What do you, What do you say? Should we have Nathan on? Yes, a... yes, you're being too unfriendly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of, of course, we would love to have Nathan Day on our cinematics <clears throat> Facebook group member on our Find Your Film podcast. That'd be great. Nathan can get maybe get, sh share some pointers on what it takes to be a an author these days, and you know, in, in this time, you know. So that'd be re very very cool. Again, the book is called Orphan. What Orphan? Or Orphan surfacing. Orphan surfacing by yeah. Nathan Day. Okay, by Nathan cool. Day, Amazon yeah. bestseller right here. Uh, Check it okay. out. Check it out. Okay, so you know what, Bruce, are you are you happy that Eric Holmes is actually bringing a little bit of a literary bent to find your film, or do you think books should be banned, aka Fahrenheit <laughs> four five one or four fifty one? What do you think? I, I mean, I might burn them if they come into my house. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, books are good. I like books. <laughs> I like read. So yeah, we'll see what <laughs> me, me like word. 
<laughs> me like words a lot. So yeah, okay, that's that's very cool. Okay, so now we have three movies that we're gonna cover. Bruce has a very an iconic movie for his What's in the Box. I think Bruce and Eric will actually be spearheading a review of a Tom Hanks movie. Eric Holmes, you you were one of the you were the first person to actually see this Hanks film. Finch, you're gonna be talking with Bruce about it this episode, right? Yeah, yeah. I found it on the Apple Plus and. I was like, oh, I didn't know this was up there. Okay, all right. So I'll check it out, and that's what I did. Spoiler alert: Is Finch better than Bonfire of the Vanities? Yes or no? What do you think? That's a that's a that's tough. Um, Bruce, what do you think? Bonfire of the Vanities or Finch? Watched Bonfire of the Vanities. Oh my, the 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 Banathies, (laughs) the Banathies, the Bon. Or I think it's based on a book. I I think it's called Bon, either Bonfire of the Vanities or the I don't read books either. But I, I believe the author is Thomas Wolfe. Yeah, obviously, if there's someone who's going to read it, it's Eric. You know, Bonfire of the Vanities is Brian De Palma's best film. Didn't you know that, Bruce? That's why I was heard. asking Eric. You've That's heard? exactly what I've heard. Yeah, That's when I exactly look at the reviews, it's you... always like top, top tier. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you, when's the last time you saw Bonfire of the Vanities, Eric? What do you think? Oh, it was a long time ago. Long uh, time ago. Wow, jeez. I'm trying to think of who was in that. Yeah, no, it's Tom Hanks, was Melanie it? Griffith. All right. Hey, Eric, uh, Eric, Bruce it? Willis. Bruce I've been telling these guys that I'm not going to edit the show that much, but now I guess I'm editing. This is we're cutting back. And this is a couple of things that I edited music wise. This is not a musical show whatsoever. This the movies we're covering this week. The main features are three films. There's a movie called Red Notice. It's a Netflix movie. And there's a movie, Kosovo set movie called Hive, H-I-V-E, that is has already been playing. I believe last week it was in New York. And then this Friday, it's going to be playing in a select theater in Los Angeles. So this movie, Hive, actually hits virtual cinemas December 3rd. Really excited to talk about that one. And then last but not least, as far as our featured movies goes, goes, we're going to be covering a documentary called Julia. And if you're thinking it's a documentary on late cookbook author and TV star Julia Child, you would be right. So those are the main features that we're going to be covering. I'm looking at the notes that Eric, Eric, you have a couple of good recommendations this week along with Finch. Oh yeah. You have a, you have a, a racing movie, the fast and the furious. Mm-hmm. Is that on our, yeah. Oh, because you, oh, what's that tie into that? Is it, is it tie into something? Oh, interesting. Uh, no, it was just a random thing that popped up this week. And, okay. Uh, well, okay. we'll get more into it later on. All right. And then I'm excited. And then Bruce is going to cover this new Benedict Cumberbatch movie that's been out for about a week on Amazon Prime called The Electrical Life of Louis Wayne. And we'll be we'll be asking Bruce if it's this this movie is actually worth watching on Amazon Prime video. Let's get to the big whale of the episode first. Let's, let's the big one hitting Netflix on Friday, November 12th is Red Notice. Hello, boys. Oh, my God. Wow. You're the captain. You might benefit from a little career change. I mean, I'm, I don't think runway, but definitely regional catalog work, flyers. She's the bishop. No shit, dip dick. It's so nice to finally meet you, Mr. Booth. Such a thrill to be face to face with the second best art thief in the world. Oh, well, I, I see what you did there. That's, <laughs> yeah, you got lucky a couple times. Early on, you know, but you can't name one time in the past year that you beat me. Helsinki. My parachute failed. Jakarta. My Segway sank. Macau. Nobody knew that Miley Cyrus was going to be there. It was a completely unannounced show. You can have excuses or results. Not both. Oh. Stars Gal Godot or Gadot? I don't, I keep, Bruce, do you remember how to say it? Is it Gal Godot or Gadot? Eric? Godot, um, Godot. I can't connect the Godots. I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard both. This is one of those uh, Margot Robbie, Robbie sort of things. Like, oh, I've very heard good. Both, okay. And I don't know which one's correct. Okay, tomato, Demi, tomato, right? Demi, Demi, Demi right. So, right. Caribbean, Caribbean. Okay. Well, she's in it. Gal, Gal's in it. And also Dwayne Johnson, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and Ryan Reynolds. Red Notice. Action Could be movie. Dwayne the Roke Johnson. The, oh, I've heard Rock, both ways. Dwayne the Rick Johnson. Could be so, so many different things. Now, really, the, the main plot summary, it'll take 10 seconds. Ryan Reynolds is a whip smart, wisecracking thief, and he likes to steal very expensive items. And one of these items he's looking for is one of the eggs, uh, I think jeweled eggs from 
Cleopatra, he's trying to collect all three of them. The movie starts with him trying to steal one of them. Dwayne Johnson is an FBI profiler who is on, who believes this jewel, this jewel thief, this big heist thief guy, played, again, played by Ryan Reynolds, is going to be invading this museum where the egg is. And of course, that's what happens. The first five minutes, you have a big time action sequence in a museum. Gal Gadot, 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 Gadot. She is, she is basically the third person in this whole... Uh, no, it's not three's a crowd. She's she's basically the person who's she her name is the bishop, and she is sort of the mastermind behind this operation. She's sort of the puppet master. She's she's the one who actually gives the thief, the art thief, the jewel thief, whatever, the thief, some hints on where to go as far as his operations go. They're in business, and maybe she might have, who knows? She might have a connection with the FBI profiler as well, played by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Maybe. Dwayne, maybe the uh, the FBI profiler is actually going after the bishop as well. We don't know. There's a lot of twists and turns regarding Red Notice. Okay, let's start with you, Bruce Perky. Your overall thoughts on this movie? Oh, well, this is a perfect segue. I would have you screen share right now, but I'll just do it through the microphone. But you will have a file coming your way for oh. for this and for okay. future episodes. Let's see if we can hear this. Now it's time for Bruce Perky's Dog of the Week. <laughs> Who did the audio for Bruce? Well, Perky? Mr. Peter Beta has back at it again. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Beta from middle class film class. We love Peter Beta very much. Every so often when a movie. He rises... dropped another audio beat, didn't he? Didn't he, <laughs> <Yeah>. Eric? <laughs> <laughs> when a movie drop that beat. <laughs> rises or falls to the level of Bruce Perky's dog of the week, then uh, you might be able to hear that uh, little uh, sounder come up. Was this dog of the week a little bit rough? Rough. <laughs> yes, very rough. <laughs> no, this movie, um, okay, this movie is just exactly what you think it would be, but in the most like generic way. And that's the problem. It's not, I, I mean, realistically, it's not terrible, but this is like what nearly $200 million of not terrible. And it's just, you know, hey, let's have um Deadpool light and let's have the rock be kind of his hulking, sort of charming self, and let's have Gal Good Dot just kind of be ass kicking and pretty and let's have them go all over the world and let's throw a bunch of stuff that's kind of like Indiana Jones in there just to kind of give you that member berries in there and spend the amount of money on this that you could have bought maybe done like I don't know a hundred beta tests for the amount that this cost so yeah this is a waste of your time really a waste of your time you, do, you, yes. do you consider it a bad movie? Just not well I mean, executed? It's so generic. And there's so many versions of this movie that are better that there's no reason to spend your, you know, two hours on this movie and just kind of walk out of it and just be, I mean, it's, it's there's nothing new brought to the table here at all. It's, it's, it's generic. Okay. So there's nothing. Yeah. Yes. There's nothing new brought to the table. And this movie, Bruce, you and I would know, I'm sure a little bit of Eric, Eric, maybe you would know too. Remember, Bruce, when we'd grow up, we'd see all the major networks, ABC, Fox, ABC, whatever. They'd, they'd have their TV movie of the week or they'd have their TV movies and you'd have TV stars starring in them. And now the way the market, I, I believe, is changing is that you'll have all these A-list stars that would maybe headline movie theaters with, with everything with COVID and streaming now. I think we're going to have a lot more, quote unquote, TV movies that are not TV budgets. They're actually mega movie budgets fitting into your iPad or your own television, thanks to streaming services like Netflix or Stars or Disney Plus, et cetera, et cetera. And I think something like Red Notice is it's really, in many ways, I don't mean this in a bad way, it's a TV movie. It's a movie that you're not going to watch on TV, in, in the theaters. It has a special effects for that, but it has the imagination and the scope for a streaming service. So yes, it is, it is very trope ridden. It is generic as you know what. But the way I see it, it's you have three mega stars doing what they do. I I was saying to myself, I'm going to watch maybe 40 minutes of this and I'm not going to get through it. I'm going to just piecemeal it over three days. I ended up watching the whole thing. I didn't mind it. I actually had a good time watching Red Notice. Do I wish there was a little bit more revolutionary stuff behind it? Yes. I just thought it was a, a very fun movie. And I, I, we're going to get to a, a couple of things on, on how I think they could have made it a little bit better. But I still had a really enjoyable time watching Red Notice, especially with all those caveats you were saying. Eric, what do you think of Red Notice? Well, I'd have to agree with you guys that, you know, this The Rock and Ryan Reynolds and Gal Gadot are, you know, doing their doing their thing that uh, you expect them to do. 
and uh, they're all quite charming. And you know who else is charming? Nathan Day. He wrote this uh, book called <laughs> Orphan Surfacing. Okay. On the back, on the back it said, "God is dead. The war between heaven and hell had waged for eons, spiraling towards its inevitable conclusion." As the book of Revelations begin to unfold, which sounds wonderful, and you should totally pick this book up on Amazon. Nice, very nice plug. Now, how about Red Notice? That's it. That's that's your review of Red Notice. Oh yeah. So anyway, so with with Red Notice, uh, you know, there's like Nazis, and they, they you know, it, it, it follows kind of uh, does kind of the Deadpool thing. Ryan Reynolds is putting hats on all the hats, and then adding more hats. And Dwayne Johnson is doing his uh, kind of. Uh, it, it's weird. He does have that gay kind of the gay kind of jokes or what what do they call that the gay fear thing the ryan reynolds is like hitting on him he's like oh i'm not i'm totally straight i don't know if nathan day is straight or not but a dark (laughs) stage has been set heaven falls oh boy okay it's once glorious armies plunge into disarray while their hellish counterparts thrive unattested this book sounds amazing you should totally (laughs) check it out so i believe it's on amazon so um, definitely not a recommendation for Red Notice. You, you, did you feel like you wasted your time your, with your two? I don't know what the running time is. Maybe it might well, be close to two hours. Well, again, I haven't read Orphan Surf and Sing by Nathan Day yet. <laughs> oh, okay. But I would say it's probably not a waste of your time. I would definitely pick it up on Amazon. I don't know what this Red Notice is you're speaking of. But okay. Uh, Red I, it, notice. It's fine. There, there's a there's a there's a crowd for it. There's fans of this type of movie, but that is I'm not part of that. So and not, not part of me. It. You know what? I'm part of it. I thought it was fine. I, you know, out of five stars, I'd give it three and a half. Definitely check it out. If you're a fan of any of these actors, I just look, it could have been, a, you know how I would have changed it. I would have just switched some of the roles, maybe not have Ryan Reynolds crack jokes every single 30 seconds and maybe have that job go to Gal Gadot, Gadot and maybe have Ryan Reynolds play the straight man. Okay, maybe the person who doesn't really crack too many jokes and maybe have Dwayne Johnson play Bishop. I don't know. Could have been they could have played with this whole this whole movie a little bit more. I thought they could have been a little bit more daring with it, but I had a good time. I enjoyed it. This is a no from Eric Holmes, not a recommend from Eric Holmes and not a recommend from Bruce Perky. I recommend. I would say that uh, I would say Ryan Reynolds cracks as many jokes as. About as many times as I'm going to plug Nathan's day book, Orphan <laughs> okay. Surfacing. On the back, it says here, uh, kings advance their pawns. The eg- enigmatic man. I can't read very well, but I it think Nathan Day is going to. You can check it out on Amazon. Pick it up Nathan, today. Nathan Day, you owe us a lot of money with all, all the name drops we've got. We've, got. we've given your book. So that is Red Notice. It hits Netflix on Friday, November 12th. Again, I enjoyed it. I recommend it just as a fun time. Eric and Bruce really did not like this whatsoever. Okay, now let's get to the next film. This is a documentary called Julia. Julia never called herself a feminist, although she was clearly really important to the feminist movement. Women were treated pretty badly in cooking school. Teachers were all European male chefs, and they'd rather not have women in their kitchen. Most women felt that they couldn't really have a career making money in food. But her success really opened up a career path to a lot of women who may not have thought about it at the time. When I started working with Julia, we'd walk into a restaurant to have a meal. Then afterwards, they'd want to give us a tour of the kitchen. And the first thing she would say is, where are all the women? How come there's no women in here? She absolutely expanded the possibilities of what women could do. Based on the life of Julia Child, I grew up, I mean, Bruce, did you grow up a, a Julia Child? Do you, did you remember her at when you were a child, just on television? Because, yeah, I remembered her yeah, quite vividly. Yeah, she was one of those people that you'd see on, like, public television. You just, you, even if you didn't watch it, you're like, oh, that lady. And then I remember the SNL skit they had, which they do show in here. That Dan Aykroyd, yes. As well. Yeah, so. Yeah, well, Julia Child, I had no idea about any about her her life whatsoever. I just remembered that she used to be on my PBS TV screen when I was a kid. And I wanted to learn more about her once once I got the email about this. And I said, hey, why not? The movie Julia, the documentary Julia opens in New York and L.A. on again on Friday, November 12th. It's not hitting on demand or digital as of yet. It Again, it is a documentary on her life. I, fi- I find it to be very interesting. You know, this is it's a talking head movie, but sometimes the subject is so fascinating and so interesting that you don't mind the talking heads because you want the talking heads to give you a little bit more information 
regarding Julia and her life. You, you get to really look at how her close relationship with her husband, how their journeys into France, how French cuisine played a very big part of her life, and how she transitioned from her years in Paris to actually become a huge TV star. It wasn't an overnight thing. You get to learn all the intricacies of her and be, becoming a pretty much a TV icon. You see all of those early steps in Julia. I thought this one, this movie went really, this documentary went by pretty fast. I enjoyed it. I think this is, is this a, it might be an acquired taste documentary, meaning if you're not interested in cooking or, or cuisine or Julia Child, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it might be a specified thing, but I ended up really, really enjoying this documentary. Eric Holmes, how did you feel about Julia? I'm not, I wasn't a real big fan of Julia Child and not, I, I guess, not meaning that I didn't like her. I just didn't watch a lot of her growing up. So I didn't have the same kind of uh, nostalgia with her as I did say with Bob Ross when we talked about his uh, documentary previously. This one, you know, there was some interesting stuff in it, but I, it didn't really grab me. I was more concerned with uh, watching her cook stuff. And after watching the documentary, I, I just kept wanting to, or while watching the documentary, I kept wanting to go on YouTube and just watch cooking videos and put on some food porn. I mean, she has some cool stuff in her past, you know, the, the war stuff, but that's kind of, you know, you have someone that's iconic and, you know, part of the culture. And then to find out what they went through before they got there is pretty interesting, I guess. But this wasn't something that I probably was seeked out on my own. Had we not had to review it for the show. And again, I'd much rather watch her cooking show. I did like how they showed how she kind of was not doing what I'm doing right now, which is fumbling <laughs> through shit. Um, <laughs> you know, watching how she kind of uh, did the shows live was kind of interesting. But yeah, overall, this documentary didn't do too much for me other than make me want to go on YouTube and watch cooking videos, Yeah, which Bruce. I want to do anyway. Yeah, Bruce. Yeah, I mean, it goes to the point about it might have a select audience. I, I, I really enjoyed this documentary. That said, going to Eric's point, do you think this is a very specified audience, or do you think it has general appeal? And how did it, how did this this documentary appeal to you? Well, uh, it might be a specified audience. I, I was curious. It, it reminded me a little bit of that Jacques Cousteau documentary, where if you know who she is, you might have a built-in at least interest to see, you know where she came from and what, how she became, what she became. And a lot of people might react like Eric does, where they're just kind of like, you know, it's okay, but why do I care about this lady? <laughs> you know, uh, and even though they do go a, a long ways to kind of describe why she was really influential and, and kind of what she did for kind of opening up the idea of women as chefs and kind of making considered fancy cuisine in quotes accessible to the masses. I think that was kind of her big legacy as well as, basically kind of creating the, the cooking show for TV as an actual thing that could be successful. Um, for myself, I really enjoyed it. I, I'd be really curious to see how different people that aren't familiar with her react. I think some people might really like it. And I bet you it's based more on kind of where your interests lie. I think that at, at minimum, if you like food or you're interested in food or you enjoy it, I think there's enough here to keep you interested, at least throughout the movie. Because they'll do this thing where they'll show her cooking, which is kind of fun and, and interesting to see the stuff she's creating and how she has to do it so quickly on a set, you know, or whatever. But then they'll have a lot of interstitials of people cooking her meals. And that's real food porny. Like it's very like high gloss, you know, high cinematography, you know, high def people cooking, whatever. For me, I'd say it's a solid recommend. I really enjoyed it. Kind of like you talked about the last movie. This movie went by really quickly for me. I enjoyed her as a person. I think she's really likable. I think that's another thing too. I mean, not as, I'm not going to put her in the same, you know, like, I guess you can in a sense, kind of like Bob Ross and kind of like Mr. Rogers or these people where they seem to be genuinely pretty good people and they seem to be doing things for the right reasons because they love it and they're trying to share it with people. She doesn't seem, and it could be, you know, they could be giving her the, the good side of things. But they didn't really paint her to be like a vindictive or, or a bad person. It seemed like she was pretty genuine. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. The fact that she she kept on working up to the end to her early nineties. She was ninety one and she was still doing television. Really inspiring story. I really I strong I strongly recommend Julia. Really enjoyed it. Again, you might not like some people might not like it because they might not be into into Julia Child as a person. 
like Eric Holmes did. But I think, you know, it's a solid recommend for me, solid re- recommend for Bruce. Eric, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I think I think one of the things that I think this uh, documentary could have benefited from was being a little more focused. Like, mm-hmm. let's talk about instead of going from cradle to grave of Julia Child, let's focus on her developing the show or developing the cookbook and kind of stay there. You know, mention the war stuff, mention her her husband, um, you know, at the end. But I think they spent too much time building up to the the stuff that's in, in uh, interesting, at least to me. And then once they were there, they got out of it quickly to get through everything else. I think if this was a lot more focus on what Julia Child did for what she's known for, maybe that would have been more interesting. Or maybe if it was just a Julia Child was in war. And this is her story of, or, you know, just pick something and focus on that rather than trying to get everything and cram it all into one documentary. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. On the flip side, that's a great, that's a great way. Actually, all of those chapters, you could have made a documentary on Julia Child. Yeah. That said, Bruce, I don't know if you agree with on this. You could have made a mini series on Julia Child. You really, with everything sure. that she's been through. Yeah. Making of the show. That's part one, part two, part two, two hours, right? Part one is her time in. In, in the war and, and then in Paris, part one. Part three is soldiering on, right? Soldiering on, meaning staying relevant in the television industry, maybe as she gets older. Who knows? That's a nine hour document. That either way, either way, I think would have worked. And I think I was getting to your point. I wish Julia had a little bit more meat to the bone, but I think. I think it works. <laughs> I think it would. No, 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 don't, not. I meant it in, in the purest sense. I, I just wish that there was a, oh, 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 dog, 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 no dog, no dog. <laughs> Cut it down. <laughs> right. No, I enjoy this documentary. I, look, it's one of these things where I think when you watch Julia, it can't really please everything because it's, yeah. there's just so much story to tell. And I think, Eric, to your point, they were just getting through a lot of stuff and they had to. And hopefully one of these days, a bigger Julia project comes out, maybe on HBO Max or one of these streaming services. But Julia, as is, for me, works as a doc. Eric has a good point. Bruce, final thoughts on Julia. The movie comes out in New York and LA, November 12th. Uh, I think that what Eric's getting at, it, it makes a lot of good sense. I think that this documentary kind of assumes a person coming in to watch it probably is sort of familiar with her and wants to get more that they don't know. So I think it's probably most value added to that person, but I think everyone can have some fun with it. I think it's good. Okay, cool. So that is Julia. Now, last, but you know what, considering Bruce and Eric's <laughs> review of Red Notice, definitely not not least is Hive. Hive, H-I-V-E, a movie. Yes. Oh, uh-oh. You know, Eric's going to throw out a, a Nathan. You're going to drop some Nathan Day on this. This this is where I will have to refuse you on Hive. Kosovo set d- drama center, centering on this mo- woman named Fari. And it's a true story. And Fari is a woman. She's missing. Her husband's been w- missing since the war in Kosovo. So she is distraught. She's wondering what's happening. Maybe he's presumed dead, but she's pr- she probably doesn't want to let go of that. Her father-in-law is in a wheelchair. He can't really help her much with the duties, along with trying to, you know, in her small town, she's trying to get make as much money for the women in her town so she can help other people. But she can also, it's very hard to help herself and take care of her two kids, take care of her father-in-law. She's also a beekeeper. She has uh, several hives in her, in her backyard. She sells honey. Really, this movie is a naturalistic take on a woman's life, on trying to make ends meet in Kosovo while dealing with tragedy. It's written and directed by Blurta Basholi and the lead actress, I'm butchering this name, Yilka Gashi. I'm, revelation to me. I, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> I, I just really, I was immersed in this movie. This is again, might be an acquired taste, but th- this film in Sundance, it won three awards in Sundance. What did it win for? Director, narrative, and I'll look up for the other awards. I want to start with you, Bruce. First, what did you overall think of this movie? Uh, I really liked it. I think it's a solid, this is a solid indie movie. But like you said, for people who don't like these really, um, I don't I guess you'd say, quote, small, focused, very kind of realistic kind of views of, day, you know, kind of slices of life, it might be too dry for them or not enough going on. But uh, for me, it would work really, really well. A couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, First of all, I totally agree. Um, Yilka Gashi, I'll say it badly too. <laughs> Who knows? It was was amazing. And she really is the core of this movie, right? You're following her and with her like 99% of the movie. 
Um, Hive, I probably wouldn't have called it Hive. I know why they did. I would have probably called it, what was it? Uh, Afjar or whatever that is. Ashbar, <laughs> which is a Ashbar. toasted red pepper sauce, which the women band together to make. And right. she's, Fari, she's trying to make, she's she's the leader in trying to, trying to make the sauce, right? Right. So, I mean, and that's, okay. This is kind of interesting. I would have never thought of this until Eric just talked about the last movie. This kind of does as a movie, kind of what he was talking about just a moment ago with Julia Child and what he thought would have been better. And this does really take a moment in this woman's life and let that kind of stand for what's going on. And uh, one thing you didn't kind of mention, whether her husband is dead or not, this starts with the, it seems like fairly regular delivery of remains. It starts with these remains are getting I guess, unburied or brought out. And then literally she's going through and looking through the body bags, trying to see if she can find her husband. And that's hanging over this entire story is that they assume he's dead. Uh, most of the women in this village or this town assume that their husbands are dead or their sons are dead, but until they get the notice, they don't know. So this, it's the basic setup of this is that you're, they're in this point where they have to either decide to just wait and kind of languish or whether they have to try to figure out how to move on. And on top of that, they are faced with the expectations of what women in the society are allowed to do and what they're supposed to do. And I thought those two base, basic tensions in this movie were really good. I really liked it. I thought it was a really strong movie. I love this film. And yeah, the town is misogynistic. The men are horrib horrific in this, in this. They're just very, very old school, just cavemen. And it's how these women try to deal. How are you going to move on? If, if you actually you try to live within the, the means of society and your husband or soulmate is missing, how are you going to make money? The only way they can make money is from selling these, these bottles of, what is it? Ajvar and, and just persevering, persevering. And oh my good, my goodness, Eric, what did you think of Hive? Uh, overall, I liked it. I wish they would have went a little harder on how, oh, how shitty women are treated in that area. Cause they definitely, they definitely touched on it, uh, touched on it on more than one occasion, but I didn't think it really, uh, I thought it could have went a little harder. There was a scene where the guy asked her out, Oh, it's just for coffee. She says no. And later on he says, Oh, it's just for coffee. And then he starts, you know, uh, right. you know, getting a little too handsy with her. You know, the fact that uh, they can't uh, look down on for wanting to drive. It was pretty ridiculous, but I, I thought they could have went a little, I, I was thinking of like the, the movie Yentl with uh, Barbara Streisand and Mandy Patinkin and the whole movie is about, you know, her, a, a woman can't read and she wants to learn how to read. And that's, that's kind of the uh, uh, thrust of it. And it really sold that idea. It leaned into it and sold that idea because it's stupid that, you know, women are treated like this. Uh, in the case of Yentl, they were treated like this. Back in the day, in the case of this, uh, women are treated like this in this part of the world, at least probably more more places as well. I, I just wish they would have leaned in a little harder on it uh, to really, really sell that. And most people might say it's a bit on the nose. But I mean, if it's still happening today, it's clearly a lesson people aren't getting. So might as well be completely blunt about it. That said, uh, I, I love the characters, love the acting, the, you know, following the following the characters and the family. You know, they're really charming. I love being with them. Wanted to, wanted to, you know, unlike the Julia movie, I loved watching them make the, uh, the, the pepper, the pepper sauce or whatever it was that they were making. I was like, I, I just want to be with them. And yeah, I, sure are, yeah. I wanted to try it. I wanted to try right? that red pepper sauce. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> It, it seems pretty tasty. And what do you just eat it by itself? Do you have it with bread? I, I, they should, you know what? They should have combined the Julie Child documentary and just show how they actually cook cook it. What do they use it for? I'd be, I'm all so about that. There's so. a scene. There's a scene that most people know in Pulp Fiction where uh, Samuel Jackson eats a burger. Mm, that's a tasty burger. And I'm watching that going. Oh, that does look like a tasty burger. And then they're they uh, in this in this one hive. They're at the grocery store trying to. Uh, sell space for their ajvad or whatever yeah. and he takes a little spoonful of the thing and eats it and like oh god that looks so good <laughs> I, need <laughs> right I need to try it i need to try it but yeah th this movie has a, a bunch of high parts uh the ending was really good i, I just wish they would have just leaned in a little harder on on some of the stuff and made it really really you know stand out and you know really damage people emotionally i don't think this will do that 
but I think it should. Cool. Good. Yeah. This movie, again, three awards in Sundance Film Festival. It's the first that I think a film has won all three major ones. This, though, is in the world cinema category. It won the the world cinema award at the Sundance Film Festival for dramatic. The It won the audience award. It won the directing award. And it won the grand jury prize. So this is a highly acclaimed movie. This is one of these movies that will continue to gain steam. It's been it was released again last week in New York and Friday comes out as well. This is sort of a, a gradual a staggered release. And I believe it's in virtual cinemas, December 3rd. Again, the writer director is Blurda Basholi. And Eric, to your point about hammering at home, I think, I don't know, Bruce, what, what do you think about this? I, maybe Blurda's aesthetic is very subtle. And so even the emotional moments, I don't want to get, get, give too much away. She, she actually, puts it in a very subtle frame. Do you think that she should have hit the stuff a little bit harder as well, Bruce, from your end? I like it the way it is. I I, I think that Eric's version would also be good. I think this one, this version makes more sense to me because I feel like you're kind of doing it in a sense from the point of view of our main character. And she, although she's she hates these things happening to her, she seems to be very much more of like, okay, this is an obstacle. How do I surmount this obstacle. Here's another obstacle. How am I going to get past this obstacle? She's almost matter of fact. And I think she internalizes. In, yeah. And in some ways that almost makes it to me, it almost hurt me a little more when things happen because she was just trying to do the basic stuff and almost, almost giving people the benefit of the doubt until she couldn't give them the benefit of the doubt, which was almost dangerous to her a few times. And also to me, it really, it gave a great contact contrast when someone wasn't like that to her. And I'm mostly thinking of the guy um, at the supermarket. I kept waiting for that shoe to drop too. And it really didn't. And I was like, not that spoiling anything. This isn't really a kind of spoiler kind no, of thing. spoilery thing. Yeah. The fact that um, he was like a counterpoint, like, well, there is somebody out there that seems to be a decent person who's dealing with them in a very straightforward way and he doesn't seem to have any ulterior motives and i appreciated that a ton but yeah you know i, I get what you're saying eric too there's a lot of this about this movie that's very frustrating to watch when you just see how the men in the town just react to so many things and especially with a shroud of just tragedy all around this town and you see just th- see these women trying you know they can't really they can't remarry because in, in custom they're supposed to stay with their husband even if they're dead and that's that's part of their culture in that small town it's just a very immersive movie. Bruce, you're going to say I, something? I, oh, I, Eric. I, I think that was maybe another issue that I had with it was the uh, the cultural differences. You know, there's there's stuff that happen happens in that area of the world that I'm just not familiar with. And so I wonder how much of that is, uh, like, if you're from that part, maybe you watch it. I mean, we've talked before, talked about the, uh, the antlers and Undine, and not that there's a monster in this one, but... You know, there's still the the cultural things that when you watch uh, movies from different countries, you know, inherently there's going to be that bit that doesn't doesn't cross. And I wonder how much of that just didn't come through with me, perhaps. And if that's the case, that that's on me. That's not on the movie. No, um, no. But yeah, I, I just think there's uh, there's certain parts, um, in the couple of parts that you mentioned, I think could have hit me more emotionally. But when they happened, like I knew that like she was frustrated or angry. I just, I wasn't sure that the moments they weren't earned from me because I didn't, I, I wasn't on that journey with her. Yeah. Maybe, maybe because uh, she internalized stuff so much and I just wasn't locked in like, like you and Bruce were. And yeah. that that's a problem on me as well. Um, no, no, no. That's good. It's good that we have these different reactions, Bruce. I agree with you there. I think the fact that it didn't go a certain way again, that way, Eric's way would have worked as well, would have been a, a movie that actually in many ways would have st- stood out more as a film to a lot of people. But some of the stuff, the way it's played out in this movie in a very subtle fashion, and it's so internal, it it re- some people will get very, not just triggered, but really hurt and moved and all that stuff. It'll just, yeah, th- this one gets you. This is actually, I'll be honest, th- this is at least a top 20 for me, maybe top 15, maybe top 10. I, I'm thinking top 10 for me for Hive. I, I just appreciated this naturalistic take I, i'm not going to see a movie like this maybe we have maybe more a couple more months to go before the year ends i'd like to see a movie that's kind of like this but i, I don't think any, anything's gonna compare like hive and mass all of these movies are, are really yeah mass i don't think I, i'm i'm trying to remember mass you were not mass bruce 
me and Eric love mass. Me and me and Eric were behind mass. Anyways, I'm definitely yeah, I, the, I think, I'm in the minority on that one for sure. Right? So. With, so, with something like mass, the, the reason I glommed onto it so much is that it's not subtle. It's here's what it is. Everything's out on the table. Everyone's expressing how they feel about certain things. And so it's just easier for me to follow. This movie's too smart for me. For my no, dumb, no, no. dumb brain. <laughs> no, 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 no. Again, virtual cinema is December 3rd out in LA which it's out in LA this Friday, November 12th. You're going to be hearing more. Hopefully you're going to be hearing a lot more from Hive, especially it's the Kosovo's entry as far as uh, international cinema for the Academy Awards, okay? So it should be interesting to see if it actually makes the final cut. Okay, so that is Hive. We are done with our featured reviews. Let us go with recommendations. Eric, let's start with you regarding the Tom Hanks film, Finch. It's a movie that you, you share with Bruce. Bruce decided to follow your lead to watch the movie as well. Wondering... What you guys is Finch worth it? I'm thinking it looks like Turner and Hooch meets Chappie. So I don't know if I'm going to actually see Finch. What, what say you, Eric? I, I don't need to review it now. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is uh, what was it? Post apocalyptic. And I don't know how much is a spoiler and how much is not. Do we know why Tom, Tom Hanks is building a robot? Bruce, do I don't remember. Did, did they say early on why he's building a robot or is that something we don't talk about? Um, he gives the robot its four main directives or whatever, but it is kind of fun to discover that. Okay. So we, we, he'll, he's building a robot for reasons. Um, the, there was a uh, solar flare that wiped out the ozone. And so it's like, well, like 150 degrees out constantly. Yep. So you can't go like humans can't go outside without wearing a spacesuit or they'll boil, you know, there's no vegetation. And so it's, it's definitely post-apocalyptic and Tom Hanks, Probably not the last person on the earth, but very one of very few people left on earth. And uh, he's building this robot and for reasons that we can't talk about. Most of the movie is him teaching the robot. So this is kind of kind of like Johnny Five. You build them mm -hmm. and I have to teach them how to talk. You have to teach them how to move around. You have to teach them how to act and so on and so forth. Or better yet, like Castaway. Except instead of Tom Hanks just making Wilson, he makes Wilson and has to teach Wilson how to. <laughs> basically how to be a human this is uh this is a tom hanks movie with tom hanks in it being doing tom hanks things this isn't i, I mentioned it before it's not going to light the world on fire but if you like tom hanks you know this is uh this is what, what cheeseburger like a sappy cheeseburger but a cheeseburger nonetheless so you weren't disappointed by this movie you didn't mind the sap you didn't mind the cheeseburger that's what you're saying you recommend it because you like cheeseburgers is that yeah. what you would say yeah okay. uh th this is not this would have been fun to watch after antlers i would have loved to have watched this after antlers uh, it would have brought me up a little bit but yeah it's it's uh i, I heard someone compare it to a boy and his dog <laughs> like maybe the fact that there's boy in his dog technically but um tom hanks isn't building a robot to help him find women to uh no. sexually <laughs> abuse <laughs> yeah it's a boy and his dog not finch finch is currently on apple tv plus eric saw it then bruce you jumped on i'm looking at some of these imdb reviews bruce some are saying boring bland can't believe i saw it but then there's some people who say i highly recommend it loved it where do you fall into this camp I, I started out in the like, I think I'm going to be bored with this. And um, I said, you know what, I'm going to give this another try. And Eric had been talking about it. And I went back to it. And with, I think the right mindset, which is like, hey, let's just check this out. It's Tom Hanks. This isn't going to blow, you know, the lid off of, you know, experimental cinema. Let's see how this works. <laughs> and, uh, and it's funny because I wrote down some of the same things here. I wrote down, you know, Short Circuit. I wrote Castaway. I wrote Fallout. If you played the game Fallout. Oh, Fallout. It has yeah, I love touches that. of that. Yeah, um, but even more so, and I'm gonna have to watch this movie again. I've bought this a while ago and have not watched it. Silent Running. Oh, this Bruce also Dern. has a lot of Silent Running, and there's even a nod to it. Um, he has another robot. He has a smaller robot that he uses to get to kind of use to carry stuff named Dewey. And the three robots in, in Silent Running are Huey, Dewey, and Louie. So that's definitely something I that's I, oh, take nice. off on here too. Shout um, out to that. Yeah. And one thing that I don't think Eric did mention, or maybe he didn't mention in passing, that this is also a road movie. So I think we talked about in Red Notice how they were all doing their thing, but it, at least two of us thought that they were doing their thing in kind of the most cynical, like expected way. <laughs> okay, and yeah. it didn't didn't really kind of work to, for us. Sure. This is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is Tom Hanks doing his thing. But if you like that, 
it actually does work. And probably because it's focused. This is not this big, sprawling, giant, intricate, you know, epic. This is a guy, a dog, a couple robots in a souped up motorhome going across the United States. I mean, that's a pretty simple concept. So you can have a lot of character moments. And if it might be a little bit sappy, sure. But you can really settle into this, enjoy it. And I've got to mention, I also have to say something that this little sounder could also work for his dog, Goodyear. Now it's time for Bruce Perky's Dog of the Week. <laughs> Goodyear. <laughs> okay, so for this a is a different reason, though. I think. <laughs> a good reason. So Finch is a strong recommend for, for you, right? Or solid? What is it? Yeah, I, I, like I said, I was about 20 minutes in. I'd kind of given up. I went back to it. And I really ended up liking it. I really, I mean, this is just one of those things where you sit down and, and just go for the ride with them. And I, I really liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. I still haven't seen last year's News of the World. I know they're two different movies. Eric, Bruce, I'm going to go to Apple TV Plus. What's the movie I put on first? News of the World or Finch? Which movie did, did you guys like better? Did you prefer? Actually, I, I surprisingly, I like News of the World, even though I'm not a fan of Paul Greengrass, like hardly at all. I think this one's better, but they're they're different. They're different movies. I mean, they okay. both have Tom Hanks in it, but I, I think I think Finch is a little more focused on what it's trying to do. News of the World is telling the story, and then it has this other kind of thing it's trying to say. And it's like, oh, by the way, this is our message. And I was like, okay, I guess that kind of works. I see what you did there, but it wasn't very seamless. And also to the to your when you mentioned the reviews that people had online, uh, the ones that say it's boring and sucks, I, they're right too. Like the, this is uh, this is yeah. a mo- this is a movie that like you're either in or you're not. You're you're either in for like like I said, this is not going to change cinema. It just is what it is. You're either long for this cute, adorable little post-apocalyptic <laughs> movie. Right. Or you're not. And so check it out or don't. I, I would say maybe check out the check out the uh, trailer. And if it seems like something you'd be into, give it a shot. All right. Bruce, News of the World or Finch? Uh, Love and Monsters. Love and Monsters. Wow. Another <laughs> shout out to Love and Monsters. I guess, I guess eventually I have to see and that movie. And then Finch and then News of the World. <laughs> and then Finch and then News of the World. Very good. Bruce, what is your recommendation this week? Oh, yeah. Mine. So we had actually planned to watch... Oh my gosh, the electrical world, the electrical life of Louis Wayne. Sorry, it's a very long title. And that was my fault. I requested screening links for all of us and we received it two weeks earlier and it ended up, I thought it was going to be that Friday, but then I said, hey, don't worry about it, guys. We'll we'll get to it when we get to it. But we never got to it, but you got no. to it. I did. I, I see it popped up on uh, Amazon Prime, I think this last Friday or Thursday or something. And I was like, okay, well, hey, we were going to watch it. Let me give it a try. Every cat fancier knows Puss loves nothing more than to sit on a piece of brown paper. Well, cats are acutely aware of the dangers of electrical rheumatism. And of course, if you ever need to punish a cat, you could just crumple the paper to make the sound of thunder. Do cats get rheumatism? Oh, yes, of course, Miss Simmons. Mr. Wing, we have been showing your cat pictures to our staff. They've been laughing, <laughs> they've been smiling. Tell them, Alicia, tell them I'm not lying. One of our typists, she took some of your pictures home to her kids and she said that they were running about on their hands and knees <laughs> pretending to be cats. Pretending <laughs> to be cats, how cute. <laughs> and, and, and asking to have cats for their birthday. We're gonna get you out there, you're a personality. Wouldn't you say, Alicia, honey? You're, you're Mr. Cat. You're cat man. Cat man. Huh? Cat man. Cat man. I really ended up liking this movie quite a bit. The basic concept is it's based on a real person, uh, Louis Wayne from the turn of the century. Uh, he's played here by Benedict Cumberbatch. If you like Benedict Cumberbatch, I'm sure you on board. Of course, yeah. Even more so, Claire Foy plays his love interest, Emily. And then Andrea Riseborough plays one of his sisters, one of his many sisters. Oh, she's <laughs> so, great. Oh, that's a, that might be a selling point. I might watch it just because of her. And you get Toby Jones in here too. Uh, Toby mm. Jones, the always great Toby Jones. Always awesome. Um, <laughs> so basic concept is this. Um, he's kind of in his own time, he's a misfit. He's the kind of guy, he's kind of this, you see him just constantly illustrating things using both hands. So he's ambidextrously like drawing with both hands at the same time. He's going to boxing matches and getting beat up because he's trying to tap into electricity that makes the crowd go wild. He's just kind of this odd guy. Just, and he's got like, 
eight sisters. They're all pretty well to do. And they're all kind of have that exasperated attitude towards him. Like Louis Wayne, you know, he's always just going to be out doing whatever he's going to do. At some point he gets a job as an illustrator because they say, well, you're a good artist. So if you can be our illustrator for this, you know, this publication, you'll be doing well. Well, and then he gets a governess for his sisters because he has little sisters and grown sisters <laughs> and immediately, uh, and that's played by Claire Foy they start to have a connection and it's kind of um they intellectually see that both each other are very unique and interesting people and then of course they have that spark between them too and for it's kind of you get the feeling that for the first time this weird nerdy dude like was like oh wow i think i'm in love you know and it's just so charming this movie is surprisingly good i was amazed at how much i ended up loving it and there's a whole thing with cats in this movie and love i love cats are you, are you a cat person yeah oh, yeah i have Cats and dogs. I know. I know you're a cat person, oh. Bruce. How about you, Eric? Are you a cat person? No, I'm allergic to most of them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Aren't you allergic, Bruce? I, and you know what? No. With cats, here's the thing, Eric. Do you know this? Most people eventually end up being allergic to cats. And it, your family members aren't they allergic? Some of them has to be, Bruce. No, no. Okay. Uh, anyway, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> but the good thing, the weird thing about it, I won't go into all of it. This is a real life of this guy. And he actually kind of changes the worldview on cats in a weird way. And there's a awesome romance in here. There is a lot of tragedy as well. And it gets surprisingly dark towards the end and a little bit unusual. This is in a weird way. This almost seemed like what Tesla could have been, but was far away from. So basically you're saying this movie is a lot more unusual than you thought it would be because yes. you're thinking Amazon Prime Video, you're thinking feel good movie, you get to learn a little bit about Louis Wayne, but it just goes on different. Oh, it does. It does go in different directions. It it the first I don't know the first half you think it's is what the whole movie is going to be, and it's not. It goes in some other directions, and that could be to its detriment and to its benefit. I mean, some people might find the second half getting a little unfocused, but I think that it adds some interesting gravita to this guy. I think it's a really pretty fascinating movie, especially for a biopic. It's it's really well done. And I think if, like I said in my little mini review, if, if you haven't discovered or have fallen in love with Claire Foy in one of her movies yet, this should do the job for you. And what about Louis Wayne? Did you, after the movie was finished, are you saying, okay, well, this is an interesting figure. I wouldn't mind not like you and I read, but if I Googled him more, or more research, what are, you know, were you more interested yes. in who? Yeah, okay. Yeah, for sure. And you go back and you look and you're like, oh, wow. It's one of those things where you like, this is, I love these kind of movies where you, it's about a real person, but then after you watch it and you go back and look at some stuff like, oh, wow, all this stuff was real. Oh, wait, this guy was really a big deal at his time and his place. And I didn't have a clue, you know? <laughs> so Did this movie delve into just the origins or I guess the seeds of human relationships and humanity as much as Red Notice did? That's what I want to. <laughs> so, so much as much as that. Yes. Yes, absolutely. There was, um, <laughs> There was a whole bunch of Indiana Jones references um, and it made me think of a book. I don't know what book. It made me think of some book. I don't know what book it was. Um, what, what book was it? Uh, oh, oh, Orphan Surfacing. Oh, Orphan by, Surfacing by Nathan Day. Day. Oh boy. Okay. So Bruce is on the limb saying that Electrical Life of Louis Wayne explores humanity a little bit more than Red Notice. I'm going out on a limb, putting words in Bruce's mouse, mouth, mouse, mouth, mouth. Okay. So I love cats too. Yeah, cats I'm a cat. Like I'm mouths in their mouths in their mouths. <laughs> <laughs> do your kids love cats or dogs more? Do they have a preference? They, they like them both. I think my littlest loves the dog so much, but mm. um, we all love our yeah. cats too. I love cats. Yeah, I wish I could have cats. Unfortunately, I, I don't know. I'm on a cat tangent. When I used to live by myself in an apartment in downtown LA, I had a cat for about seven months. And then I had the, the sad news that my sister and my mother and my father were all allergic. So there was no way they could ever visit me. So that's one of the things about the cats. Eventually, a lot of people like Eric Holmes are allergic to cats. And if you don't, if you're not initially allergic, I, I've heard of cat owners, cat guardians. I think yeah, a lot of people like say cat guardians, they eventually become allergic to cats. So it's an existential dilemma with cats, in my opinion. I wish I, I had cats all around my house. That would have been a wonderful thing. But that's enough about me, the electrical life of Louis Wayne. It's currently streaming on Amazon Prime video. Eric, you had a couple of things to say about the Fast and the Furious. I don't know. What, what do you want to say about the Fast and the Furious? The Fast and the Furious? I did. I saw a movie called The Fast and the Furious. I was uh, going through uh, Fandor and I saw a movie directed <laughs> by John Ireland and Edward Sampson that came out in oh, 1954. Oh, get out of here. The Fast and the Furious. Get no way. Are you, are you being serious? Yes. Okay. Tell um, me about 
that is so, amazing, Eric Holmes. What a, that is, you know what what Eric Holmes did to us this week, Bruce? He, he uh, did you know this? Did, was this no. a surprise to you? Mm-hmm. No, he he pulled a misdirection. He knew that you and I would probably get a rise that he put. That he actually that he actually put the Fast and the Furious because here we are, hoity toity Louis Wayne guys, and we love our hives. And then he knew, he knew. He just threw that in there, thinking, oh, do we have to talk about Vin Diesel and r- rest in peace, Paul, you know, Paul Walker and everybody else? No, he wanted to do some John Ireland. Okay. Let's hear it. That's yeah. amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, the, the thing says a trucker framed for murder breaks out of jail, takes a young woman hostage and enters her sports car in a cross border road race, hoping to get to Mexico before the police catch him. And that is the that doesn't really make too much sense. The the weird thing about this movie, first of all, I didn't really like the movie too much. It, it was all right. Uh, it was a Roger Corman joint. Um, not directed by him, but produced by him. Um, but the weird thing is when we usually go back and do classics, we don't come across like uh, cheeseburgers that often. Usually the movies that survive are the the classics with a capital C because they they entered something new in the film language or they mean something they introduce a character or a new style of filmmaking or something. It's not very often that we come up with the Fast and the Furious equivalent to a 50s movie, which is also called the Fast and the Furious. Um, <laughs> then, and so I, I, I just thought it was kind of uh, remarkable for that point of view. The, the story doesn't make much sense. Uh, guys starts off and he kidnaps, uh, let me bring up her name, he kidnaps a woman played by Dorothy Malone. Oh, very popular actress in her day. She started this movie, if I recall. She started this best known for one of the movies that she's very popular for is, I believe, this movie called The Spiral Staircase, Dorothy Malone. Okay. Anyways, yeah. But yeah, I mean, she was real good in it. John Ireland, who uh, he was uh, the main star and director. Um, he was, you know, really good, in, you know, for what it was. Um, but it, it was just neat watching a cheeseburger. But anyway, he, he kidnaps her and then... They leave, you know, I don't know why exactly he kidnapped her, but he did. So they're leaving and he takes her car. And she's got a Jaguar. Uh, people are always commenting on it. And she's always trying to leave until she somehow falls in love with them. Because, oh, you didn't really do what you say you they did, Jack. Oh, I, I believe in you, Jack. And then they decide that they're going to enter a car race because that's what you do when you're running away from the law trying to get to Mexico. <laughs> it's like, quick, let's enter a car race. <laughs> Um, it's it's pretty stupid and ridiculous, but yeah, I just saw that. Hey, black and white movie called The Fast and the Furious. I better watch this and see what this is all about. And I that did. Is amazing. And this is uh, exactly exactly how I feel about The Fast and the Furious in two thousand one. Is I imagine what I would feel about The Fast and the Furious in nineteen fifty four. The fact that uh, Fast and Furious paid to be able to use that name later on, I guess, kind of makes sense. So very, very good, Eric. <laughs> very good. I love I love it. I love it. So Fast and the Furious, I believe it's 1954. Roger Corman gets a story credit in this movie. And I, I was trying to brag that Dorothy Malone starred in this movie called The Spiral Staircase. I thought I know a lot of things, but I don't. It wasn't Dorothy Malone in The Spiral Staircase. It was this actress named Dorothy McGuire. So I'm just correcting myself before I wreck myself on this one. So Dorothy Malone never starred in The Spiral Staircase. She starred in Fast and the Furious with John Ireland, who also co-directed this movie and this movie is currently streaming on Fandor. Props to Eric Holmes, who he should actually have the comp account for Fandor because he's been covering more Fandor than me. So props <laughs> to you, Eric. Thank you so much for that Fandor coverage. I think we're done with our recommendations. Are we done? Eric, you got yours, Bruce. I think you're. We're, we're gonna do what's in the box now, right? Are we doing what's in the box? Is that what we're, what we're doing? Before we do that, what do we? What do we? Do we have a, a musical interlude? What's our musical interlude? Yes. What happened? Yo, yo, Pete, yo, Petey Pancakes, drop that beat. <laughs> Who's in the box? No, oh, what's in the box? You lie! No! What's in the fucking box? I love thank you, PD Pancakes, and thank you again for the dog doo-doo audio drop that you're that we're gonna start using on our show now. So really appreciate you uh, being the chairman audio mix master of the Find Your Film Universe. And of course, you ha- you have that podcast, Middle Class Film Class, which you guys can find anywhere where you listen to podcasts. Very interesting. Pod, Bruce, your turn. Yes, yes. So we're doing Akira from 1988, directed by Katsuhiro Otomo. This was suggested by Brian O'Connell. 
Brian O'Connell. Yes. Oh, we, we mentioned Brian O'Connell, O'Connell how many times last week? So many times. Lots of times. Yeah. Brian O'Connell. Um, wait, did you re- did Brian you O'Connell. have time to rewatch Akira, Eric, or is this Bruce's? I, I went I went through most of it. It's still got about a half hour left that I'll oh. watch after we're done here. But I, I I've seen it before and it's just kind of re- refreshing after what like thirty years, twenty years since yes. this. This is maybe my third view. I probably haven't seen it for a good. 15 or 20 years myself. And I, this is one of those movies I think actually really holds up well and, and, and gets uh, to me, it almost gets better, but I guess, I mean, just personal taste. It is, you know, animated anime feature probably considered one of the granddaddies of at least, you know, bringing anime to American audiences, especially, I think it got a lot of exposure compared to anything else before that. Um, So what's the basics of this movie? This movie takes place in Neo Tokyo in the future of 2019, um, <laughs> only two years ago. So the idea is that uh, there was, you know, giant kind of apocalyptic thing. Now we're back to this kind of sort of more of a cyberpunk version of of the future, and we start out following uh, these motorcycle gangs as they're speeding through the streets. And uh, two main characters in there are Kaneda. And that's, if you've ever seen it, there's that iconic red, kind of red motorcycle and the guy all clad in red, that's Kaneda. And then his best, one of his friends in the gang is uh, Tetsuo. And Tetsuo is kind of a little more picked upon. He's not as quite as cool. And early on, he crosses paths with this strange child that looks pale and he looks like a child, but he looks aged, like, like an old child, like a very old man child. And very quickly, you get kind of embroiled in this this really interesting, strange story of um, government slash scientific experiments. Maybe the military is involved. Uh, maybe they're creating telekinetic or mind control with kids. And things get involved with Tetsuo, and it kind of goes from there. Visually, this movie is amazing. And it goes, this is, I, to me, like the epitome of epic, kind of, epic post-apocalyptic sci-fi and probably one of the best I think that's been made definitely one of the best in the 80s I mean this couldn't be a live action movie in the 80s and, and look as impressive as it does with this animated version I'll let Eric um, speak up as well but one of the things I looked up on this was this is just gives you an idea of the kind of care they put into this movie they said the movie consisted of 2212 shots and over 160,000 single drawings which is like three to four times more than they, what they usually use in a movie like this. And they also used 327 different colors, which were, and 50 of which were exclusively created for this film. So there's a level of detail in this movie and hand-drawn beauty that is stunning, to this day, stunning. Amazing. I remember in my, I just remembered in my college, the first couple of years of college uh, at my dorm, there'd be a bunch of kids having akira posters up in their their dorm room so it's still like yeah. and that was 30 years it was what what was 30 years ago and that's uh really cool that's very very yeah eric it's really cool yeah, Your third year still hold up for you akira yeah actually uh, a lot better than i thought it would I, I remember watching this as a kid and the uh the animation was just mind-blowing to me i was like because i knew that when they do animation it's every 24 frames a second so Every second they have to draw 24 things like they have to draw that much detail in each frame. So it was, uh, and then, so watching it again, I start noticing other little, uh, animation stuff that they do like with, uh, mostly with light mm-hmm. that just went right over my head as a kid. And I'm watching it now going, Holy shit, how the fuck they pull that off. And so, yeah, that the animation holds up big time today. You know, there's a couple parts where you see, they kind of, when you're, doing that much you, you have to cut corners somewhere so you know you see a little bit of flaws here and there but overall it's fantastic and the uh i'm just getting to the part at the end where uh shit gets really bonkers so i'm re- the, that was the part that i remember really blowing me away as a kid so i can't wait to see how that part goes but so far the animation is awesome the story is just weird enough and just makes enough sense to kind of keep you going and the uh, giant, what was it? The giant bear and the giant, the yeah. giant stuffed animals. Yeah. That stuff's great. It's got that. It's got that uh, kind of uh, weirdness that they love to put in Asian cinema, and especially in in anime type movies. I mean, this is I, I, if you watch anime at all, this is this is the one, Granddaddy. Know, that, yeah, yeah. 
This is like uh, you talk about film, Godfather 2, that's the one you got to see. You know, you talk about anime, Akira, that's the one you got to see. So, okay. And I, and I think it, uh, I think it earns its status. I think since there have been other animes that have, that I like better, like uh, Gantz, for example, is an awesome series, but that doesn't take away from the fact that this one, this one still holds up. However, it, what, what year did that come out? It come out in 77? 88. 88 wow mm-hmm. i was uh, 11 years off so <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah at however many years however many decades later uh kira still holds up and check it out because it is pretty freaking sweet yeah again i started college in 89 at ucla and i akira po- posters adorned the the dorm room halls and walls and everything and i always wondered what the heck is that and still 31 years later i'm still w- wondering what the heck is that so maybe it's time i end up watching akira sooner than later as well as watching some more movies on fandor and all that stuff i need to uh, pick up my game on that we are going to end this show with what is in the box what's in bruce. the box bruce it's in the box bruce uh, nothing what's is in the, the box, box. all right is what we're gonna do what are we gonna do bruce <laughs> bruce is our scheduler what are we doing bruce bruce what are we doing that's not in the box what's bruce? not in the box well, What's not in the box? We, we are ready for this month's All right. uh, Captain Coon's Hidden Gem of the Month. Uh, it's my turn this week and then next, or the next, this month, and then next month it will be Eric's turn, I believe. I decided we're going to do one that's fun, easy to get for anybody, not too heavy or artsy. We're going to just do something that's kind of goofy, but I think kind of awesome. And I still don't think it gets enough, enough love for my taste. And that is a heavy trip, heavy trip from 2018. It is directed by, let me look at the names here, uh, Husa Latio and somebody else, Yuka Vidgren. (laughs) Nailed it. (laughs) I'll give you the little synopsis. After years of playing songs by other artists, the opportunity of a concert in Norway encourages a metal band to compose their own songs. This is the... If you've been watching uh, Lords of Chaos or those kinds of things recently, or if you've ever watched Medlocalypse, this is the Wayne's World version of that. It is available a lot of places. Let me look that up real quick for you. Hopefully too. it's still on Amazon Prime Video, maybe. It's not. Oh, wow. uh, you can get it in Hoopla, Canopy, or Arrow if you have Arrow Video. Uh, but you can get it for like one or two bucks rental everywhere too. And I, I think it's, it's well worth it. This is one of those... I don't know. This to me, this movie is just fun through and through. Okay. So so next week we're going to be doing it instead of what's in the box. All three of us will be watching heavy trip as part of the segments. What is it? It's Colonel Coons. What is it? Hidden gem of the month. Hidden gem of the month. Yeah. So that is very, very cool. Are you excited for heavy trip? Eric Holmes. You haven't seen it yet. No, I, no, I don't think I have. This will be fun. It will be. It'll be okay. Yeah, Bruce. Actually, I believe you reviewed it during the early days of Find Your Film, correct, Bruce? You yeah, I did. Recommend- and yeah, this will be my third watch now. I've watched oh it my three gosh. times. All this, right, this uh, I love. There's so many fun things in this movie. Three times out of the four times, uh, th- three weeks out of the four weeks in every month, Bruce does have a What's in the Box segment where you, the listeners, can can actually email Bruce a movie pick. So email bruceperky at gmail.com and I tell him, hey, I would like to throw, I would like to suge- suggest a movie. Don't suggest bobbleheads. He's already seen it, but you can suggest a movie to, for Bruce for him to put it in the proverbial box. And then hey, Bruce, Bruce, have you seen Emoji Movie? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. no, 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 no. Oh, no, so- no. oh yeah, you can throw Emoji <laughs> Movie. I don't think, well, I, I don't think he's seen the Garfield films yet. Yeah, so there's a bunch of movies that you can you can actually throw. You know, the Snowman's really good. Have you seen oh, the Snowman? Snowman? I have no, seen no, the Snowman. Snow, <laughs> Snowman, I don't know. He says he's seen it. I don't think he's seen it. Uh, so well, maybe I've seen it. hear great things about that one, starring Rebecca Ferguson and Val Kilmer. I heard Val Kilmer's pretty good in that, too. But oh, by the way, we all, love, we all love that movie, that documentary, Val. Love, love that documentary. All right, guys, that's it. Air Combs, any final thoughts? Yes. Orphan Surfacing by saying, Nathan Day. Nathan Day. We love, we love Amazon, Nathan Day. Check it out. And Nathan yes. Day, maybe he'll come on the show and tell us more about Orphan Surfacing. Yes, very good. You can get that book on Amazon right now. We mentioned Nathan Day's moniker about 500 times on this episode. I love it. He's the, he's the uh, Brian O'Connell of this week. Of this week. We'll see who's next week. <laughs> who's the name next week? Bruce, you're signing us off. Yes. In honor of the recently departed Dean Stockwell, 
I'm going to paraphrase Frank and say, you were one suave fuck. I have no nothing else. Oh, that, I know what reference that is. That's that's Blue Velvet, right? Sorry, I'm slow on the uptake, but thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, Bruce and Eric are not. We'll see you guys next week on Find Your Film. Take care, guys.